And I want to talk in the time that's allotted to me about a particular part of the 16th and 17th century, the so-called Reformation era, and that is to speak about the concerns of the reform movement within the Catholic Church at that time, because the Church's response and the Church's life and the Church's organization was not simply a response to the challenge of the Protestant reformers, but it was a response to a growing need that had been identified in many parts of the Catholic Church long before Luther published his 95 Theses. And I want to begin by describing what it must have seemed like for not only a bishop or a priest, but all the uh, believers in the Catholic Church in that period in the 16th century. When I was consecrated a bishop, a priest gave me a fascinating book. I don't quite understand the motive uh, for which he gave it, but it was a story of a bishop who had been appointed to a diocese in what is now Belgium, called the Low Countries at that time, or Spanish Netherlands, appointed at a time right after the Council of Trent, toward the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. And it is a story of that bishop based upon his own diaries, the collection of his letters, the annals that were kept in the diocese, a story of a bishop who was sent to implement the decrees of the Council of Trent, really on the frontiers of Catholic society. For not more than 20 miles away was the center of a strong Calvinist movement. Now, I was fascinated by the story of what the challenges that he had, because the, the church, as it emerged out of the Middle Ages, was not the kind of well-oiled and organized machine that we come to think of it, but it was a kind of mishmash of sometimes conflicting jurisdictions, conflicting permissions and privileges. And the bishop, when he came to his diocese, realized he had to deal with questions such as which religious order has the right to maintain which parish church or to maintain which school. And added to this was the fact that he had to deal with a new order that had become quite uh, aggressive, uh, the Jesuits. Where do they fit in, in this picture? They had been at the forefront of the preaching uh, that came out of the Council of Trent, uh, the forefront of pe uh, preaching missions. Where do they fit? How do you organize this? And in fact, are some of the structures, some of the organizations, still necessary to the life of the church? Or need there be a kind of rationalization? He had to deal also with outbreaks of popular piety that had gotten out of control. And I think it is an instance of how people react in a time of confusion when they are seeking a clear message. And there was a kind of explosion in his diocese of uh, uh, alleged apparitions of private revelations and he had to deal with each one of these very carefully. Now, after reading that book, I came to the conclusion that I have nothing to complain about. <laughs> Even though I have to travel a lot, there are questions that come my way. There was nothing quite like the confusion that, that he had to face. And this, this confusion had existed for a great part of the period, because at first, I don't think many people within the church knew how to react to this challenge. 
And it was only over a period of decades that it became clear how, in fact, the Catholic Church would respond, what it would stress, how it would organize itself for this effort, and how, in fact, they would clarify what it meant to be a Catholic and what that meant for our lives. Now, this is really an extraordinary history. In fact, when I was still teaching, the uh, count of the Catholic Reformation uh, took two weeks in, in my curriculum. I won't spend that long a period with you. <laughs> and I thought that what I would do is go to probably the central event of the Catholic Reformation, and that is the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent began in the year 1545. It concluded its work in 1563. It was a very long period, but there were uh, years within that period in which the Council never met, because when it was first gathered, there was even opposition to the idea of a Council. There was not a very clear direction being set it was only later, in the 1550s, early 1560s, that the church came to a conclusion about how it was to answer the challenge of the Protestant reformers, but also how to draw together the many strands of Catholic revival, Catholic reform, that had begun a hundred years before, and how effectively to make these a part of the church. Because I think the Council Fathers at Trent understood that this was something new. And it required sometimes innovative approaches. One of the aspects of the Council of Trent was a kind of rationalization of church structures, a slow elimination of those competing jurisdictions and privileges that had been so typical of the church of the, the late Middle Ages. And in fact, I think it is an irony that if you want to get a sense of how the late medieval church was structured, you don't look to the uh, Catholic Church, but look to the Church of England, who preserved a large number of those structures, those cathedral chapters, uh, the uh, position of dean and whatnot. But the Catholic Church slowly abandoned many of that uh, superstructure and came down in the place where the Second Vatican Council came down, and that is the essential structure of the Church revolves around the sacrament of order, which is bishop, priest, and deacon. Now, I, I mention that because the uh, reforms of the Council of Trent were extraordinarily significant and, in fact, shaped the church for 400 years. But there were a number of things that that council wanted to do. And it had a very difficult uh, atmosphere in, in which to work because at the time there was no clear separation between what we would call church and state. There was a close intermingling of life in the church, life in the state, life in politics. Very few people in the 16th century would have conceived of a state that did not also pray together. And maybe one of uh, the speakers mentioned the uh, great peace of Augsburg in 1555, in which it was decided in order to hopefully end the religious wars, to establish the principle cuius regio eius religio. Whoever is the ruler of the state, that is the religion of the state. And after 1555, there was a great movement of peoples from one uh, area to another. And this kind of pressure existed 
certainly not only in England, where Henry VIII declared himself supreme head of the church, it existed in Catholic countries as well. Pius V once remarked that King Philip II, who considered himself the champion of the Catholic cause, had so tightly embraced the cause of the papacy that Pius V said, I'm choking to death. <laughs> because sometimes Philip II did not make a difference between the cause of Catholicism and the advancement of Spanish interests. But this, this was all uh, part of the, the background. So the Council of Trent met in order to try to direct faithful Catholics toward an understanding of who they are and how they are to live. And there were five issues that the Council of Trent really had to uh, direct themselves to. One was the issue of church discipline. Now that is how do you organize the church in such a way as to effectively manifest its being and effectively to proclaim the gospel and to call people to holiness? Now this had to do with uh, the structures, with the training of, of priests, and it was here that I think the Council Fathers wanted very clearly to identify a need for reform or reshaping. For example, one of the uh, decrees of the Council of Trent insisted that bishops actually live in their diocese. One of the difficulties that had arisen in the late Middle Ages was that uh, several, in fact many, of these bishops were also, because of their training, their education, parts of the civil authority. They would be named a bishop of a particular diocese, by and large to assure them of an income. They would be brought to court to serve the prince, and the diocese, in the actual day-to-day -day running of it, would be put into the hands of a vicar general. Uh, this was certainly true in England. Uh, bishop John Fisher surprised his fellow bishops by actually living in the Diocese of Rochester and taking control of parish visitations, of the training of priests. He was unique among the English bishops at that time, and what is, even deepens the irony, he was the only English bishop who could not accept Henry's claim of supremacy. So the Council of Trent insisted that bishops reside in their diocese and take a very deep and daily interest in the life of the people there. The greatest example of this, I think, in response to the Council of Trent was an individual whose early, early life in the church would not have indicated that he had that kind of sanctity and stamina, and that was St. Charles Borromeo, whose feast we celebrated yesterday. St. Charles Borromeo came from one of the wealthiest families in Italy. He was brought in to the administration of the church by his uncle, who was the pope. And he was made a cardinal at a young age because of that. But at the Council of Trent, where he served as a secretary, he caught a deep realization of the power of the Spirit moving in that council and what it was calling Catholics to do. He went through really a profound, uh, profound conversion of life. And after the council, when he was made Archbishop of Milan, he became a model of the consul's bishop, teaching, training priests, visiting parishes. 
reforming those things that needed to be reformed, calling people back to the understanding of, of what they are as sons and daughters of God, what are their responsibilities as Catholics. And in fact, this call to conversion was sometimes not very happily accepted. One religious order hired a hitman to uh, assassinate Charles Borromeo. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the man showed up when Charles Borromeo was presiding at Vespers in his cathedral. The man fired, and luckily the pistols at that time were so badly inaccurate that the bullet just spun around. It did strike him, and for the rest of his life, Charles Borromeo delighted in showing people the scar. I wonder if that's where Lyndon Johnson got the idea. <laughs> but I think the greatest example of Charles Borromeo's devotion to the pastoral office that was called for by the Council of Trent was the fact that when a great plague broke out in Milan and many of the wealthier members of that society fled from the city, Charles Borromeo remained to care for the sick, often carrying them himself to hospital, anointing them, preparing them for death. He himself died at the age of 46, absolutely exhausted by his, his uh, pastoral work and pastoral concern. But he became a kind of model of the reinvigorated episcopacy that the Council of Trent had called for. He also was one of the first to establish a seminary that was called for by the Council of Trent for the training of priests. For there was a difficulty uh, in, in many parts of Europe before the Reformation about priests who were ordained without proper training and preparation, by and large ordained simply to say masses for the dead. And in order to overcome what could be a scandalous situation, the church insisted that every diocese have a seminary. They outlined the course of study. And it was Charles Borromeo who, at Milan, created the seminary that became the model up until the 20th century. So the first concern of the Council of Trent was that kind of discipline. And in fact, the ideas for this kind of discipline went back, interestingly enough, into the reform of the Spanish Church before the Protestant Reformation. If the Catholic uh, Reformation began anywhere, it began in Spain, which remained untouched, really, by the Protestant Reformation, I think by and large because it had already reshaped, restructured, and reformed itself in a Catholic pattern. The second thing that the Council of Trent was very concerned about was clarity of teaching. That is, they wanted to make absolutely certain that people knew what it meant to be a Catholic. In the 30 years before the Council of Trent or so, there was uh, so many conflicting ideas and theologies that it was causing people real distress. They didn't know from day to day in what they heard or read whether this was Catholic, whether this was not. So the Council of Trent established a series of decrees on the teaching of the church and insisted that they be taught to all of the faithful. And for that reason, they created one of the first catechisms of the Catholic Church so that the teaching would be clear and it would be forceful and would end the confusion. The third thing that the Council of Trent wanted to do, and sometimes people forget this, and that is to stress the mission of the church. Even though in Europe there were grave difficulties, challenges to be answered, the 16th and early 17th century was one of the greatest periods of missionary work in the history of the church. I think this was begun because of the great explorations of the period, 
but there was a renewed sense that the church's fundamental idea must lie with mission, must lie with proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and in organizing its way in order to do that. Now, there were missions inside Europe. I think the success of the Jesuits had very much to do with their sense of mission, their sense of preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Christ. And in fact, <clears throat> the Jesuits won large parts of Germany and Poland and Hungary back to the Catholic Church because of their preaching and their sense of mission. And I think this sense of mission encouraged a sense of a desire to share what one had. There was a kind of public display of Catholic faith that became more and more popular. I don't know if uh, any of you have traveled to southern Germany, in Austria, parts of Switzerland, but you look at the churches there and they are in that Baroque and Rococo style filled with light and color and magnificence and the the very art and the architecture became a declaration and a missionary effort to declare this is what it means to be a Catholic and there was a real desire that as Catholics express their faith, it be done in a large and public way. Corpus Christi processions. Uh, some of the more extraordinary expressions um, that I, I saw when I was in Spain. In one uh, city in Spain, <clears throat> they have uh, on Good Friday a parade, uh, they, uh, they call them de los feos, of the uglies. They are big paper mache the statues that are created uh, through the streets. There is a, a statue of Judas Iscariot. There's a statue of the devil. Uh, uh, for instance, there's a statue of Anna Bolenia, Anne Boleyn, who kicked Catherine of Aragon off the throne. And as the statues are paraded uh, through the streets, people boo and hiss and throw things at them. <laughs> I mean, that's a rather exuberant form <laughs> of Catholic expression. In, in southern Germany, where I studied for a while, it was a little more subdued. They just like to go out on New Year's Eve and fire shotguns into the air. <laughs> but there, uh, I think this was a part of engaging the popular imagination in the mission of the church. And that was part of the desire of the, the Council of Trent. A fourth aspect of this Council of Trent was a stress on personal reformation, personal sanctity. Now, in this area, I think the Council of Trent caught a wave rather than initiated one. For back in the late 15th century, say in the 1470s, 80s, and 90s, there was a growing interest in personal conversion, personal prayer, a deep and personal encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. This found expression in such movements that came out of the, the Low Countries and the Rhineland in Germany, known as Devotio Moderna, the modern devotion. Probably the great classic of this Devotio Moderna is the imitation of Christ of Thomas a Kempis. But it expressed that deep desire to be in union with Jesus Christ, to manifest his life in our own, to conform our own to his, and to recognize the need for deep conversion and transformation of life. We all know of the great Spanish Carmelite reforms initiated by Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. A call for that personal sanctification by being drawn in to the contemplative union with God. Teresa of Avila said, if this is our vocation, if this is our future, why not begin it now? There was an incident from the life of Teresa of Avila that I, I remember 
quite vividly when she had come to visit a bishop. She had to visit the bishop because someone had reported her for being a heretic. And she went to defend herself, and she thought, well, I'm here before a bishop, accused of heresy, I'd better pray. So she, she prayed, and all of a sudden, she felt absolutely transported. She said, I had been made a part of a conversation. I could hear voices, but not as I hear in this world. And she realized that she had been taken up into the conversation between our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. And as she emerged from that experience, she said, this is life. I shall seek no other. And of course, as you know, after that, uh, she continued to reform, but there was a long period of dryness in her life when she knew she had to depend on faith itself. Although she was um, a very happy woman uh, about this, was even joking about her difficulties. You all know the story of her being tossed out of a carriage and falling in the mud and looking up and saying, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few. <laughs> in her autobiography, she would explain something by talking about the game of chess. And then she'd stop and she'd say, oh, what a foolish woman I am. I just revealed that I know how to play chess. And here I am, a Carmelite. Uh, but uh, there was a, a profound joy and power in her life even though she called other women to lead a life that any of us would find rather austere, if not to say impossible. But there was always a great joy. And she was always kind of picking at her friend John of the Cross, whom she called my little Seneca, because he never seemed to smile enough. And uh, John of the Cross also knew that Teresa of Avila used to like to receive large hosts at Holy Communion. And when he would see her coming up, he'd break off the smallest portion <laughs> and give it to her. And this John of the Cross, in being wrapped up in this reform, this mystical uh, theology, this reformation of life and personal sanctity, wrote probably some of the finest Spanish poetry to come out of the 16th century. He caught that, that popular form of poetry, knew how to use it for religious purposes. And this was very much a part of the Catholic Reformation. That is, drawing aspects of human life into a religious purpose. And it touches upon what I think is one of the great divisions between uh, Protestant and Catholic in the 16th century. And it is not really over justification by faith. It is over the effects of sin on human nature and whether in fact things of God's nature can actually be made to mediate the presence of the divine. Wasn't that the reason why the Catholics began to stress more and more the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Why it would draw popular forms of uh, even entertainment into religious purposes in order to transform them, but also in order to teach that, in fact, grace is transforming nature itself, that nature is opening up to the grace of God, that sin is not a destruction of nature, a deep wounding of it, certainly, a confusion and a darkening of it, but no one can utterly destroy what God has pronounced as good. That touches upon the stress on marriage as a sacrament. But it was part of that belief that in our common life, 
in our life here, in our very humanity, we are called to a sanctity that allows us to become part of the life of the Holy Trinity. And so many of the writers, in, uh, Catholic writers in the 16th century began to stress this. And one of the greatest of the spiritual writers, St. Francis de Sales, who by God's grace is patron of this diocese, insisted that every baptized Christian was called to holiness. And I, I want to stress that because he stressed the point 400 years ago. And I think that when I was growing up in, as a child, I was often given the impression that the church was divided into two classes. The first class were the professionally holy. <clears throat> they were the priest and sisters. And the second class was everyone else's, uh, whose only job was to stay out of God's way. <laughs> of course, the Second Vatican Council goes back to the 16th century, goes back to the writings of uh, Francis uh, uh, de Sales and says, no, every single Christian is called to a life of holiness. But as St. Francis pointed out, they are called to a life of holiness within their particular vocation. And it's within that vocation that one comes to understand how one participates in the life of God. And this was a very powerful uh, aspect of the, the Catholic Reformation. And we are heirs today of the extraordinary works of spiritual and mystical theology that came from that period. <clears throat> I think if there was a missed opportunity at this time, and it's something that we are only today beginning to, to uh, deal with and perhaps heal, was a continuing separation of dogmatic theology from spiritual theology. Dogmatic theology being the more academic theology, the theology of mind, uh, of, of the rational process, of organizing the text and whatnot. Mystical theology seeming to be something separate, a separate life. And this, this was a missed opportunity, I think, in the 16th century to draw those things closer together. And in our own time, we have a number of theologians who have stressed the fact that to do theology requires a life of prayer and is rooted in the prayer of the church. Hans Urs von Balthasar said, that a true theologian is on his knees. Um, now, if, if you write like Hans Urs von Balthasar did a 15-volume work, his must be calloused. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there was a missed opportunity in the 16th century. The last thing that I would mention <clears throat> that came out of the uh, Catholic Reformation was a revitalized papacy. The position of Pope at uh, the beginning of the 16th century was again part of this confusion. Many people did not know whether in fact the Pope was the spiritual head of the church or an Italian prince. Uh, the Pope used to make alliances with monarchs, other princes, against other Catholic princes. He became involved in, um, in many of the internal disputes uh, Julius II, for example, who was elected uh, Pope in the year 1503, saw himself as an Italian patriot, and especially trying to drive the French out of Italy. Now, this confused uh, the role, and, and popes would often get involved in political uh, disputes almost against their will. And I'll give you an example of one that complicated the picture greatly. When Henry VIII appealed to Rome for the annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, the Pope who was then reigning in Rome was Clement VII. Clement VII had just seen his city taken <clears throat> 
by the troops of the Emperor Charles V, who was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. Now, it was while Charles V sat controlling Rome that the petition came. What part this play, I, I don't know, but there was a real confusion. But I will say that in the history of the Catholic Church, no reform movement has ever succeeded without the support and leadership of the papacy. And the Council of Trent, understanding this, called upon uh, the papacy, I think, to revitalize itself, re-express itself as uh, that spiritual leader of the church, and to insist on what has been called since the time of Gregory the Great, back in the end of the uh, sixth century, the freedom of the church. That is, that the church must be free, one, to proclaim the gospel and to educate its people. Secondly, to name its own administration, to name its own bishops, to ordain its own priests. And thirdly, to be free to carry out the works of charity to which Jesus Christ calls us. Now sometimes these were difficult to maintain even in Catholic countries. For uh, example, in Spain, the monarchy knew that the Catholic Church was one of the few principles that united all Spaniards. And they wanted to make certain that that church was truly in, in tune with the monarchy. And it was not until the 20th century that the Spanish government had the right or lost the right to pass on bishops in Spain. That's how long that had lasted. In the year 1903, the Austrian emperor intervened in a papal election to veto the election of a cardinal he considered an enemy. So these were very, very difficult things to do, but the, the papacy itself had to be revitalized. And I, I will kind of uh, end with this because there was one pope who I think uh, came to uh, epitomize the Catholic Reformation and the, the spirit of the Council of Trent, and that's uh, Pope St. Pius V, who seemed to combine in his person that desire for clarity of teaching, that desire for mission, that desire for personal uh, holiness, for a kind of rationalization of structure so that the structures really supported the work of the church and new papal leadership. Because while the Protestants and Catholics were arguing, and unfortunately sometimes fighting very bitterly in northern and western Europe, in southern Europe, there was a great threat of the Turks. And it was by and large Pius V's call to defend Europe against these new Ottoman Turks, uh, a very strong military power that swept into the Arab world, that I think focused a lot of attention on his leadership of the Christian world. When he gathered that fleet together to face the Turkish fleet, uh, fleet at Lepanto in 17, uh, 1571, when he asked all Catholics to pray the rosary for the success of the Christian fleet, when he had found he had difficulty even getting Catholic princes to support this effort, naming Don Juan of Austria as admiral, a man who I think made his reputation in a slightly different area <laughs> than naval warfare, but that defeat at Lepanto ended the threat to Christian Europe. I think if the Turks had been victorious there and on Malta, the discussions of the differences between Catholics and Protestants would have been moot because Christendom may have disappeared. <laughs>
So it was in the, this area, this sense of the Catholic Reformation that I said goes back far below, uh, before the publication of Martin Luther's 95 Theses that we are to find the roots, but obviously a lot of this reform movement was shaped by the necessity to face the challenge. And I hope that I have given you some sort of idea of how the church in the 16th century faced this challenge and, and the successes that they often had. It was a very difficult process. The Council of Trent called for the establishment of a seminary in every diocese and the first seminary in France was founded in 1624, two generations after the consul. And it was founded by, of all people, Cardinal Richelieu, who was kind of a Machiavellian in uh, politics, but he was the one that found the first uh, seminary. It was a slow process, but there was a, a, a deep, willingness and a deep commitment on the part of this new generation of bishops and on the revitalized papacy that allowed then this Catholic Reformation to bear fruit. I do point out that many of the responses of the church were responses that are historical. That is sometimes, you know, we try to go back to a period and say, well, let's try that here. But many of it was based very deeply on a Catholic understanding of what it means to be a believer, what it means to live that belief, and what it means to be called to holiness. And for this, we thank that council.